Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome to class. Thank you all for joining class. Also welcome to our e-learning students who will be listening to this uh, lecture uh, later on. Uh, we'll begin. Uh, today we'll be uh, studying 2 Timothy chapter 4 and with that we uh, will finish studying the book of 2 Timothy and we'll move on to uh, the book of Titus. So before we begin our study on 2 Timothy chapter 4, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? That's great. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day that you have given us. Lord, we praise you and we bless you for this day. Lord, even as we have gathered here to study your word father god we pray and ask you to help us to open our eyes of understanding that whatever we learn father god we apply in our lives and live a life that is pleasing unto you god i pray and ask you to anoint our dear pastor lord as she will be uh, teaching us your word father god anoint her O lord and use her for your glory and we pray father god every student that is in this class father god let the spirit of understanding and wisdom come upon us O oh lord and uh, may we bring glory to your name in jesus mighty name we pray amen amen, amen. thank you roslyn so we'll begin uh, studying uh, second timothy chapter four um, so can we just take some time to uh, read Second Timothy chapter four, or maybe what we can do is: Do you think we uh, you want to read the entire chapter, or can we just read a couple of verses? What you all suggest? Read the entire chapter, or read a couple of verses, and then study that, and then move on to another few verses. Any suggestions? Five okay. Uh, we'll begin by reading uh, uh, verses one and two. So, can one of you read Second Timothy chapter four, verses one and two, please? I charge you, therefore, before God and and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. So here, uh, actually, we know that Second uh, Timothy is uh, Paul's last letter. And hence, these are, uh, even as this is the uh, end of his letter, the last chapter for us in this book, uh, it's the final words from Apostle Paul. So verses 1 and 2 are very important, where Paul is telling Timothy, you know, here is my charge, okay, or here is my final ad admonition to you, my charge to you. And, uh, you know, when you give somebody, you know, a, a final charge, a final ad admonition, it's very, very uh, important. It's really important. And the word here, charge, uh, you know, um, uh, translates a strong word from the biblical Greek, uh, uh, which is all, uh, which is often uh, translated as testified. You know, uh, like we read in Acts chapter eight, verse twenty-five. But the idea is uh, that Paul, you know, gave a solemn testimony to Timothy, and this testimony is that Timothy must heed uh, to the things that he's telling him if he would want to be a godly uh, pastor. So the word charge basically is translated as testified. And so Paul is giving this idea that it's a solemn testimony to Timothy. And so the testimony here is that, you know, if Timothy wants to be a godly pastor, he needs to heed all that Paul has been telling him. And Paul is saying that I'm charging you before the Lord. So uh, it's not just a polite encouragement he's giving him. This is a serious one. Uh, he's saying, you know, uh, I'm doing it in, in front of God, and I believe God is watching over me even as I 
charge you. Okay. Uh, so what is the thing that he wants Timothy to do? He says in verse 2, what are the things that he needs to heed uh, this young Timothy if he wants to be a godly pastor? And what is the final testimony that Paul is giving him or the charge that uh, Paul is giving him? The first thing is to preach the word. Okay, So saying preach the word and he's been telling him this throughout you know, the first, first, first Timothy and second Timothy, various instances says, don't argue, don't debate, don't dispute about things that false teachers are teaching. You know, just preach the truth in God's word. Just teach the pure doctrine in God's um, word. And so this is something that we must do as ministers. You know, we must preach and teach the truth in God's word. The second thing it says is be ready in season and out of uh, season, which means, you know, whether it's convenient for you or whether it's easy or not easy, preach the word. And so Paul is saying this because, you know, he has been in difficult situations. Uh, he's gone through uh, perilous times when he was beaten up, when he was uh, no, no, uh, facing near to death experiences. Even when he was in house arrest, he was preaching, teaching, writing, uh, ministering to people. Um, and he did that even when times were not convenient. It was not easy for him. So he's saying, you know, preach the word in season and out of season. So sometimes, you know, uh, when we go through seasons of life, it's not very convenient for us. It's not very easy when we are going through challenges when we are facing difficulties when we are facing challenges but we just trust in god's strength knowing that we can do all things through christ who strengthens us and uh, <clears throat> preach the word you know and uh, the holy spirit will work powerfully in and through us i remember reading uh, uh, a funny incident you know um, uh, there was once uh, uh, in the church of england a clergyman you know, who was gloriously saved and uh, and Jesus changed his life and he started preaching the gospel in his own uh, church, the own parish that he belonged to. And when he started preaching, all the people got saved. Then he started preaching in the neighboring churches or the neighboring parishes. And, uh, you know, the clergymen in those neighboring uh, uh, parishes were offended. And so they asked the, uh, the bishop to make this man stop, stop him from preaching. So when the bishop confronted him, he said, you know, the bishop told this clergyman that I hear you are always preaching and you don't seem to be doing anything else. And, uh, you know, this man, this clergyman who God had miraculously changed, answered, he said, you know, well, bishop, I only preach during two seasons of the year. So the bishop was kind of very glad. So he says, okay, I'm glad to know that. And what are those seasons? And he replied, in season and out of season. Okay, so uh, we need to be ready always in any season, you know, uh, to preach God's word, to teach God's word, and do that with uh, the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. So even as you preach and teach God's word, Paul is telling Timothy, you know, um, preach and teach the word uh, in a convincing manner, okay? Uh, it means, you know, uh, convince here basically means, you know, to convict people of their sin, of their transgressions, of their false deeds, of their wrongdoings, or their false doctrines that they're teaching, you know, challenge them to live a life of righteousness and not a sinful life, you know, do that with persuasion and encourage uh, the hearts of people to to live lives that are holy and pleasing and what Christ has done for them on the cross that he has taken on their uh, punishment, their sin, and he's given them a life of righteousness. This, uh, the other thing he's saying when you preach and teach the word is uh, not only convince, but also rebuke, which means, you know, lovingly correct, bring correction in the lives of people. And the the next thing he says is exhort, which means just invite, encourage, motivate, and inspire people. Okay, so invite them to you know embrace the truth of God, encourage them to live the truth, to walk in the truth, 
um, uh, to believe the truth and motivate them to live their lives as honorable and pleasing and just inspire them. And he says, when you do all of this, you know, when he says, when you, uh, uh, when you preach the word, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So he says, do this with all long suffering and teaching. Long suffering means basically with all patience. Um, so when you're teaching, be patient. Uh, you know, there are times when uh, or the fact is that people will not get everything that you are preaching or teaching. Um, they will not just go and, you know, immediately change and set their lives right and do what you have exhorted them from God's word uh, <clears throat> just because they heard it once. But, you know, he's saying, you know, keep on repeating, keep on uh, teaching in many different ways. And even as you're doing that, Timothy, be patient with them, patiently present the word, uh, giving people time to embrace the truth. So that is what we need to do as ministers of God. Sometimes we can use the pulpit, uh, you know, to speak woes on people, to, you know, to bring judgment and punishment on them. Uh, and to be very strict and rude with them. But, uh, you know, uh, Paul is telling Timothy under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of course, you know, uh, be patient, uh, lovingly correct, teach, you know, keep on teaching, keep on correcting. Uh, so sometimes we can give up, you know, when we're preaching or teaching people and say, you know, do they not get it? Uh, are they so slow to listening, so slow to doing things? Can't they change? You know, um, we need to know that we just need to be patient with them, just like God is patient with um, us, okay? And Paul also talks about this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, where he says, you know, Timothy, avoid all foolish uh, uh, arguments and ignorant disputes because, you know, they just bring about strife, but the servant of God must not quarrel, must be gentle, to all able to teach and patient. So he's repeating this. And I think he's over and over again in this let two, uh, two letters that he's written to Timothy, he's repeating this again and again, which means that it is important, which means the Holy Spirit is reiterating this fact and this truth to us as well, that you know we should be patient uh, teachers of God's word and being patient with uh, people. Uh, any questions, any doubts? Any questions, any doubts? We'll move on to verses three and four. Can um, you don't have any questions or doubts or need more clarity? We'll move on to verses three and four. Can someone please read verses three and four, please? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Okay, thank you, Zalaturi. Uh, so here Paul is telling the, uh, Timothy that you know, time will come when people will not endure son, sound doctrine. They will not want to listen to the truth of God's word and uh, you know um, they will just want to hear things that pleases them, pleases their sinful nature, talk about uh, prosperity, talk about uh, happiness, joy, uh, peace, pleasure, wholeness, and all of those things are some things that they will, they will like. But we talk about sin, salvation, sanctification, righteousness, judgment. They might not like it. So, you know, even in the world that we live today, you know, people like to hear, uh, you know, messages that are more... Um, makes them feel good, makes them feel more happy. There are motivational messages and uh, they don't want to listen to messages that talk about a sin and a salvation. So, you know, and also we see that people will flock to churches where, uh, where you know, preachers are motivational in their preaching, um, you know, uh, talking messages that are, make them people feel good and happy, you know, uh, just stroking their, uh, you know, whatever, the, how they're living, their lifestyles. And, you know, they just go to such churches. They flock to such churches to listen to such um, uh, preachers. And they are so gullible to the enemy. They are so open to the enemy. And they are the ones who can be 
immediately and very soon mis misled from the truth they wander from the truth and these are the ones who will you know uh, follow myths and fables and man-made uh, stories okay so he's saying that your people want to replace paul is telling timothy people want to replace the truth or the the doctrines in god's word with man-made fables and man-made stories and so he says you know uh, turn aside they these people turn aside to fables so once people leave the truth in god's word they often embrace these um, fantastic stories fantasy stories uh, and these are the men and women who reject the truth uh, instead of uh, believing the truth they reject the truth and um, it's not that they don't believe anything or it's not that they believe in nothing but it's that they believe in anything and everything that they just receive and hear okay so they can even come to a place where you know they hear uh that the universe came about by chance and they would just believe that they would just believe that the universe came by chance and uh, you know uh, uh and they just believe this as a fable so paul is telling timothy it's so important to keep teaching and preaching the word of god so this is something that we also need to uh you know receive for ourselves in our time in our generation because people um there's so many uh, wrong philosophies uh cult groups that have come up, uh, religious ideologies that are being uh, taught, you know, and people are listening to it because it's pleasing their ears, it's stroking their, or it's just uh, motivating them to continue living their sinful lives. Nobody wants to, uh, you know, uh, their lives to be transformed. Nobody wants to live righteous, holy lives. Uh, so they will believe all of these fables and myths and fantasies and they will just enjoy listening to them and flock to preachers who preach that but we are supposed to keep preaching and teaching the truth in god's word so what is a danger here you know when we miss out on all that um uh you know the truth in god's word uh, we miss out on all that god seeks to do in and through us and bring in and through our lives through his uh, word uh, because God's word you know um, is the truth and the truth can set us free but if we don't continue to read God's word we don't listen to God's word we don't listen to the truth in God's word then the truth cannot set us free okay like we read in John chapter 8 verses 31 and 32 uh, the second thing the word does is uh, you know that the word you know gives us a so solid foundation you know, um, the, the wise and the foolish man, we read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, you know, um, when people uh, uh, hear uh, uh, and do the word of God, that's they, it's only then they have a solid foundation and it's like a house that is built on a rock that will weather any storm, storms of uh, any false teaching, cult groups, you know, uh, things that pleases their ears, it will all just, you know, they will weather any kind of storm. The third thing that the word does is the word sanctifies us. The word, uh, you know, jo uh, Jesus in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, uh, Jesus says, your word is truth. He's saying the Father, your word is truth and the truth uh, sanctifies us. Okay, so the word sanctifies us, it sets us apart from sin, from, from everything that oppresses us and depresses us. This word also purifies us. We read this in First Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And the word also builds us up, like we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. There's so much more that the word does, you know. Um, uh, it's a double-edged sword. The word, uh, you know, gives us life. The word brings encouragement. The word brings hope. Uh, the word, uh, you know, uh, bring makes his promises a yes and amen in our lives. When we speak God's word over our situations, we see his promises come true. This, so there's so much more that the word can do in our lives. And so he's saying, you know, uh, preach and teach the word. And that is also for us in our time and age. <clears throat> sorry uh we'll move on to verses um, uh, five to eight so can somebody read verses five to eight please but you be watchful in all things 
and your afflictions do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who, who have loved his appearing. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So here in um, verse 5, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, Timothy, don't get distracted by the things that are happening around you. Just be sober, be watchful and careful. And then he says, endure afflictions, which means endure hardships. He's been telling him this, you know, endure hardships like a soldier, like, a, you know, uh, like an athlete, like a farmer. Um, and he's saying, you know, end, endure afflictions, endure hardships, because that is part and parcel of uh, ministering or being part of the kingdom of God. OK, so ministry uh, is just like life. You know, uh, in life, we face a lot of afflictions uh, that we have to bear with. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a ministry is also like that. Ministry is also comes with its afflictions, its hardships, its uh, difficulties. Um, because, and sometimes, you know, um, when we say that ministry, in ministry, we go through hardships, difficulties, um, uh, people think, hey, that should not be. It's not possible, right? And it can be a very disturbing thought because they think that ministry, you know, would be a place where it's all a very beautiful spiritual experience, you know, beautiful spiritual experiences one after another. You know, there's plenty of... Uh, <clears throat> the wonderful blessings, uh, even as we're serving God, because we're serving the King of Kings and we serve the Kings of King. You know, it's a privileged position. It's a, it's an honor. And the King of Kings just takes care of us, looks after us, you know, like uh, he carries us in his arms and his hands and he does everything for us. Um, but, you know, ministry is uh, in ministry, there are also afflictions which needs to be um, endured. So it's just like life. Ministry is also like life, just like we go through afflictions. Um, you know, ministry also we go through afflictions. Yes, Abu Bekar. Yes, Abu Bekar, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? Sorry, I can't hear you. It's a mistake. Oh, it's a mistake. Okay. So, um, Paul is telling Timothy, you know, stand strong in tough times. Don't shy away from uh, problems and challenges and difficulties. You know, in the midst of difficulties and hardships and persecutions, keep proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And, you know, uh, complete your ministry. Complete the work that God has called you or assigned uh, for you to do. Complete the assignment that God has given you. So I don't know how many of you are in full-time ministry or engage in some kind of ministry. I believe maybe all of us are, you know, um, just know that, you know, uh, that you will endure hardships in ministry. Um, and it's not that uh, you're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing because you're suffering. Um, or it's not that it's not the will of God. But uh, you know, ministry also has its share of difficulties and uh, sufferings that we need to endure. And God gives us the strength. God gives us the uh, encouragement and he will uh, make a way um, and he will guide us and lead us. And so Paul is talking about his own journey, the sufferings and the afflictions that he endured. And he's, uh, Paul is very aware uh, and he's, that's why he's writing about this or mentioning about it in verse 6, 7, and 8, that he's going to be, uh, you know, martyred soon. He's going to die soon. Uh, and his life will be offered up for the sake of the gospel. So look at how he talks about his life being offered up. He's saying, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. Now, why do you think Paul is talking about this scenario? 
or you know of being poured out as a drink offering any ideas when you look at drink offering what comes to your mind any thoughts it's okay even if you're wrong you can was paul about to like die or yes he is going to die so uh, he's saying he's been poured out as a drink offering but why does he say you know being poured out as a drink offering why does he use this imagery So when you look at the word offering, yes, Lubega. I think it is because Paul, being a Roman Catholic, uh, a Roman citizen, he knew the kind of death he was supposed to die. They were supposed to behead him, and the, the way the the blood would be flowing, it would be in the same way blood used to flow. I mean, an offering used to be offered. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Lubega. So here, basically, you know, Paul is talk is a Jew, and so you know, Jews are so uh, uh, the sacrificial system is so ingrained in them. It's just part and parcel of their uh, daily lives. You know, uh, 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 the temple, the sacrifices, um, the rituals that they used to follow. So here, he's saying he's being poured out as a drink offering. He's basically talking about. Uh, the drink offering that was made every day in the temple uh, as a morning and evening sacrifice. You know, um, uh, in the temple, you know, every day there was this morning and evening sacrifice that was made. And uh, there was a, uh, uh, and we read this in Exodus chapter 29, verse 40 and 41, uh, where a lamb was uh, taken you know and the lamb was uh, sacrificed and was uh, uh, as as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people uh, for the day and you know uh, also one tenth of an ephah of flour and of uh, mixed with you know a one fourth of a hin of pressed oil and one fourth of a hin of wine uh, which was a drink offering so the the lamb that was sacrificed was burnt on the altar um, and the blood that was sprinkled basically uh, resembled the atoning sacrifice that was made for the sins of the people and this um, uh, the grain offering or the drink offering that was made every morning and evening along with the lamb that was sacrificed was basically an offering that was a consecrating uh, 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 offering of consecration. So what the people were uh, saying is we are not only, you know, uh, atoning for our sins, but we as the people of God, you know, are consecrating our lives. We're setting our lives apart uh, for this holy God who lives in our midst, who, who speaks to us, who comes in our midst. So, you know, just basically consecrating themselves. So uh, this uh, meal offering or this drink offering is also the, the tithes that they used to give. So they're consecrating uh, their very lives. They're consecrating everything that they have uh, to God. So Paul, you know, uh, did not view his execution as, uh, you know, a cruel tragedy uh, or as an unfair treatment um, uh, for the many years of uh, the, that he has served in preaching and teaching the gospel. But he actually saw his life as the culminating offering of a sacrificial uh, life. And it's so beautiful, right? Just to, uh, of course, you know, Paul was a zealous Jew. He was so grounded in the Jewish uh, law, the Jewish systems, the rituals. So he knew everything so well. And so look at how he is looking at his life. He's looking at his life not as, you know, going to be ending in a cruel tragedy or as an unfair treatment for the many years that he has served, has been faithful to the Lord, but he's seeing his life as, you know, a culminating offering of a sacrificial uh, life. Um, after the sacrificial lamb has, you know, was being placed on the altar, just before that, you know, the fire was lit, 
uh, you know, the priest used to pour out uh, that, uh, you know, the quarter of wine. And it was the it, it was the final sacrifice poured out on the existing sacrifice. The existing sacrifice was that lamb. And the final sacrifice was that drink offering, which was the wine that was uh, poured. So that is how Paul viewed his uh, his own death. His, his whole life he's been, you know, he's saying his whole life he's been living as a sacrifice that is, uh, you know, being presented unto God. Now he's saying even in his death, you know, he's like that drink offering. So the lamb is being kept on that altar, just ready to be the the fire to be lit uh, on that lamb. But just before that, the priest pours out that um, a drink um, uh, offering. So that is the final sacrifice for the existing sacrifice. And so Paul is saying, hey, even as I've, you know, lived my entire life as this the sacrifice, you know, but now my uh, my death is like that that wine that is poured on the existing sacrifice, you know, is poured on top of that, uh, like a drink offering. So, uh, you know, he's basically meaning to say that, you know, it's important to finish well, you know, uh, and he's saying that we also need to view all of our life as an act of sacrificial worship to God. So beautiful, right? Um, we need to view our lives as a sacrificial uh, worship uh, to the Lord. And if you remember what we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you know, Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in the view of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, and acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of um, worship. So uh, how beautifully Paul is viewing his life uh, in the given circumstances, in the given situations, in the loneliness, in the despair, in the frustration, in the brokenness, but he's looking at his entire life as an act of sacrificial worship and his death, you know, as a drink offering that is poured on top of um, it. So, uh, you know, uh, his whole attitude to serving God was not one um, of, you know, um, uh, you know, receiving just praise and uh, acclamation from God or just from others. But, you know, uh, and the same should be with us as well. You know, where we serve God, not just to receive uh, uh, praise from men, not just to receive, uh, uh, you know, to be applauded by men, but you know, we serve Christ as an act of worship towards uh, Him, okay? So even if things are not going your way, people are bad-mouthing you, people are gossiping behind your back, you know, um, uh, it's okay. You know, you, are, you have laid your life as a sacrificial offering on the altar, as a sacrificial worship, uh, to the Lord and um, your, your life is being, uh, uh, you need to ensure that your life is a good, pleasing um, sacrifice in its, in his presence, in his midst. And also that, you know, our life is an aroma of Christ, like Paul says, you know, we need to be an aroma of Christ everywhere we um, go. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, God tells the prophet Haggai and he writes in the book of Haggai, he says, you know, God tells him, shut the door of the temple because your worship is like noise to my ears and your uh, sacrifice is detestable in my sight. Uh, why? Because, of course, he, he say, you know, you take all of these, you bring me lame and sick animals. He says, you know, try presenting this to your governors. Will they accept this offering? But you have the, you know, you bring it to me. And so God was so uh, uh, displeased with the sacrifices and all the people that, what people were doing, you know, and that is a reminder for us. You know, when we are serving God, um, is our worship, is our preaching, our teaching, is our sacrifice, or all that we are doing just noise to God's ears? And it is, is it detestable that he's saying, hey, stop, you know? Uh, it's something that we need to look into our own lives and see if our lives are being an aroma of Christ and if our lives are being that, um, you know, spiritual uh, act of worship or spiritual service of worship to uh, God, okay? So Paul is basically telling Timothy, we need to finish well. Uh, and, you know, um, uh, in, in God's service. And, um, 
even as Paul was a great apostle to the Gentiles, you know, even as he did more than any other apostles in spreading the gospel, uh, than any other person in church history, uh, we see that, you know, um, uh, he views his life as something that has to be expendable, which means, you know, a little, relatively little significance for himself, but uh, a, a life that is uh, willing to just being laid down for God, uh, willing to be uh, abandoned from every selfish desires and motives and pleasures and, you know, um, willing to just be uh, uh, destroyed for the sake of uh, Christ, okay? So he's saying, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we could finish well, or uh, he's saying, I can finish this race well because, you know, I see my life as something that is expendable as a drink um, offering. Okay, and Paul writes about this uh, similar on these similar lines in uh, when he told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter twenty verse twenty four. He says, "But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of." Uh, God, you know, sometimes uh, when uh, 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 in ministry we, you know, we fight against people who question our authority, who, you know, who um, uh, challenge us, who uh, gossip behind us, who talk bad uh, about us, uh, because you know it is, a, you know, it's uh, our egos are stirred up, our pride is stirred up, and uh, you know we want to fight against them. But Paul is saying, hey, you know, I'm living my life. Uh, Laying, have laid it down for Christ, and everything that I'm doing is like a sacrificial offering to uh, God. And because of how he views his life and how he views his death, uh, you know, we see or we read what he says, you know, there's a deep sense of accomplishment in what he says. He says uh, 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 what he's done in his life. He says, you know, I fought a good fight, you know, which is a deep sense of accomplishment. He says, I've finished the race, which means he says, I've completed what I God has called me to do and to say that you know is something really great and he's saying I've kept the faith that means I've fulfilled what God has called me to do and there's a crown laid up for me so there is a reward there is an expectation a hope a reward that he is looking forward to uh, just so powerful and just so wonderful uh, to read how Paul views his life how he views his death and I think, you know, this is so important for us to, um, to receive, to see for ourselves, um, to also lay down our lives as a, a sacrificial offering to God as an act of service so that no matter what happens, no matter how people treat us, what they say, uh, what they do, you know, nothing is going to hinder us from fulfilling what God has called us to do and ac accomplishing what he has purposed for us to uh do okay any questions any doubts anything anyone likes to say on these verses good powerful verses you know we learn so much not just from uh paul's writings and teachings but just from his life as well you know just for him to say imitate me like i imitate christ uh is something and it's just so powerful and i think uh, it's not just Paul, but all of us who God wants us to come to that place of Christ-likeness, of bearing the image of Christ so that um, uh, we can portray him. Any questions, any doubts? If not, we'll move on to verses 9 to 11. Can somebody read verses 9 to 11, please? Be Pastor diligent Zimani. to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Christians for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for, for he is useful to me for ministry. Thank you, Roslyn. So Paul is basically longing to see Timothy. Um, you know, uh, he's longing to see Timothy because he says here, you know, uh, others have left him. 
and um, only Luke is with Paul. Uh, we also read a very sad account of Demas, who is a fellow worker with Paul. Uh, Paul talk, mentions about him in Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, and Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. You know, um, he basically, uh, uh, Demas must have uh, probably traveled with Paul, ministered with Paul, uh, and seen all the things that Paul has done, how he's ministered, listening to his teaching and all of that, um, you know, but um, uh, he's now forsaken Paul and the work of the kingdom and he's drawn away by the things of the uh, world. So this is a warning for us, you know, um, we can be people who are in the world, preaching, teaching, in ministry, um, also with fellow believers or ministers who are strong in the word, rooted in Christ. We're being built up, we're being strengthened. Um, but if we are not working out our salvation with fear and trembling every day, you know, any one of us, you know, it could be any one of us who could easily be drawn away for the things of the world and fall away. So it's a warning uh, to be on guard. Um, um, you know, and, and a warning to watch our life and our testimony very, very uh, closely, okay? Um, and he's telling Timothy, you know, uh, watch your life and your, uh, uh, your ministry very closely um, so that you don't abandon your calling, your ministry that God has given to you and be drawn away from the things of this uh, world, just like Demas. And uh, we do not know what happened to Demas, um, uh, but just Paul mentions uh, a few things about him, and that is all we know. And then in verse 11, he says, only Luke is with me. It's very interesting uh, to see that, uh, you know, Luke here is referring to John Mark, who is Barnabas' uh, nephew. And uh, interesting what Paul writes, and he says, uh, he's useful for me in the uh, ministry. Uh, but if you know of Paul's association, uh, first association with Luke or John Mark, uh, it did not go very well. When Paul went on his first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas went together. You know, Barnabas um, took his nephew, John Mark, and they left to Antioch and they went to the seaport town of Caesarea. And from there, they sailed to uh, Cyprus. And then they came, when they come to the east coast of Cyprus, you know, they went all around to the west coast. And when they went, uh, reached the west coast of Cyprus, you know, John Mark uh, would have had enough of traveling and ministry. Maybe he wanted a break. He, maybe he felt homesick. He wanted to go back home. And Paul did not take that very nicely. He Paul was very upset. He did not forget about that. Um, and, uh, you know, when Paul uh, wanted to go on a second missionary journey, so he calls uh, Barnabas to come along with him. And Barnabas tells him that, hey, let's take John Mark along with us to accompany us uh, as a team. Uh, you know, uh, Paul disagrees. And they had such a sharp disagreement. The disagreement was so sharp, so strong, that Paul and Barnabas split ways because of uh, John Mark. So we see that Barnabas took John Mark and went uh, you know, uh, on a missionary journey, and we see Paul took Silas and went to um, Antioch. But, you know, later on, you know, maybe Paul would have heard uh, all the ministry, the good things that John Mark was doing. Uh, he would have met him, associated with him, see how he's doing his ministry, how God is working in his life. And, uh, you know, uh, Paul set uh, right his, his understanding, his his uh, his perspective on John Paul, sorry, John Paul, <laughs> John Mark, and uh, you know, um, um, uh, he he uh, takes him on uh, his missionary journeys, and we see that during the last days of his life, John Mark uh, is with um, uh, Paul and. Paul tells, uh, says that, you know, he's being very useful for Paul in the uh, ministry. So there's something that we can learn from Paul here, that yes, he had a misunderstanding or he wrongly um, uh, judged or misjudged uh, John Mark. Um, but then even if he was right, but, you know, John Mark would have changed. We don't know. Uh, but Paul sets his thinking aright and, you know, he associates with him. Uh, he let 
goes of what has happened in the past. Um, so the same thing that we need to learn and do, you know, yes, people would have hurt us, people have done things uh, that um, are not right or wrong, um, but maybe they have uh, set themselves right, maybe we have, uh, uh, you know, misjudged them, misread what they said or doing, uh, but when we know that, you know, we have been in the wrong, uh, you know, we need to set things right, um, not hold thing, uh, people's past against them, let it go once we see them walking in God's ways, doing things that are honoring God's sight, ministering in a powerful way. Um, and that is so redeeming when people don't look at your past, but look at what God has done for them now. Uh, you know, we also need to uh, do that with each other, even as ministers of God, even as, you know, um, husbands, wives, uh, with our spouses, with our children, with our in-laws, our family members, you know, just set things right when we see people change, uh, when people uh, come back, when people uh, relate to us in a nice way. We need to let go of people's past and work with um, them or associate with them and just, just uh, don't hold people's past against them. Okay, we'll move on if anyone has any questions. All of you with me? Yes, no? Okay, thank you, Zelatoli. Uh, we just have one more minute, so... Uh, we will be looking at verses 12 to 5, uh, 12 to 15, uh, when we come back after the break. So we'll take a break now and come back and look at verses 12 to 15. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> 